From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Anne-Marie Hordern, I'm Joe Matthew. One month. That's how much time Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says the U.S. government could have until it can no longer satisfy all its obligations. The X date coming as early, she says, as June 1st. Elsewhere, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy is in Israel where he spoke to the Knesset. He also made headlines about the U.S. debt ceiling. Debt limit. The president still hasn't talked to me. And Wall Street in Washington picking up the pieces after the second largest bank failure in U.S. history. President Biden looking to calm nerves after First Republic's forced sale to J.P. Morgan Chase. While depositors are being protected, shareholders are losing their investments. And critically, taxpayers are not the ones that are on the hook. We'll have more on those stories coming up, plus conversations with Tennessee Senator Bill Haggerty and tennis rep, uh, Texas Representative Michael McCall. That's all ahead. Joe, we finally have a date. The X date yes, is indeed. one month from today. One month from today. Much sooner than everyone was expecting. Well, that's right. At one point, it could have been in August, and we thought or maybe the there'd be some time. Maybe it bleeds into fall. Uh, this really creates a new urgency around the problem. When you look at the congressional calendar, there are real questions about whether they could meet that deadline. And the House is out of session this week. That's right. The House is out now, and what do they have, three weeks to get it done when Before they come back? June 1st. Not a great timeline here. And joining us around the table to talk about this and our other top stories, Bloomberg's Deputy Managing Editor, Wendy Benjaminson, and Ben Bain, who covers the SEC for us. Wendy, uh, the X date drops. We've been talking about this, you know, and what, how it might change the conversation, how it might light a fire here. But knowing, <laughs> as I just mentioned, uh, the timeline... Is it realistic to even talk about a solution, or do they need to suspend the debt ceiling to buy time? The Congress, I know they're going to need to suspend the debt ceiling. And when you said light a fire, they, Janet Yellen just threw a Molotov cocktail up Drink. toward the hill. Um, you know, she's... When you say they have three weeks, that often doesn't include Mondays and Fridays. Yeah. And so we're talking days. Congress has days to get this done. The White House has days to decide whether... They are going to negotiate with Biden or with, excuse me, with House Speaker McCarthy or not, whether President Biden is. And he has to make a decision on that. And he's not known for making decisions quickly. No, he's not. He's known for potentially dragging things out. But we right. heard from the president today about the debt ceiling. Take a listen. Most important thing we have to do in that regard is to make sure the threat by the Speaker of the House to default on the national debt is off the table. We pay our bills. And we should do so without reckless hostage taking from some of the mega Republicans in Congress. So President Biden is basically continuing on this path of there has to be a clean debt ceiling. We're not going to negotiate. But that's starting to unnerve the business community. Yeah, I mean, it, it basically, as, as Wendy was just saying, I mean, we're, the clock is ticking. And what we got today was really a matter of days. And you're, people sitting in you know, businesses, whether they're on Wall Street or in, on Main Street, they're wondering, is Congress going to make this happen? And you hear the White House saying, no, it has to be X. And you hear Republicans on the Hill saying, no, it has to be Y. And I don't know how you get between those two letters in the alphabet right now, because uh, <laughs> they better figure it out quick. And, and no one in the business community really has a sense of how that plays out. Yeah. We'll see. Well, X marks the spot on this particular day here. And knowing that the, the White House, well, it was just today in the Rose Garden at an unrelated event, Hostage taking, that's what we hear. Mm -hmm. The president says, I have no problem negotiating the budget, but raise the debt ceiling first. Right. And he's been entirely consistent on that. Does it matter to Americans watching this, though, or saying, well, that's when, and that's, of course, then the budget and the parliamentary <laughs> procedure. Like, who cares? The Just three-dimensional chess he's playing? Yes, yes, is what people are thinking. Four-dimensional chess, I guess I should say. Um, but he, is, right, you're exactly right. The American people right now are going to watch what happens with the economy. I, I honestly don't think we're in danger of default. Somebody's going to blink. Mm. I have a feeling it's going to have to be President Biden, at least in terms of getting some talks going. Mm -hmm. That then might allow Congress to save enough face to suspend the debt ceiling um, before anything happens. But you're right. No one's 
he is playing chess here, and he's trying to figure out where he has at best advantage as his reelection campaign takes off. But no one wants a reelection campaign to take off with the threat of worldwide economic crisis. I, I mean, and and while Republicans, I mean. Joe Biden and the Democrats have been saying that Kevin McCarthy will take the heat for this from voters. Yeah. And sure, Democrats will blame Kevin McCarthy. Republicans, independents, business owners could just as easily blame Joe Biden. I don't think he's right in suggesting that he's going to be harmless here. This isn't the only financial or economic story that's up for debate today. <laughs> Far from. Right. Um, we also started out this morning with a bank bailout. First Republic being bailed out, being bought by J.P. Morgan Chase. Yeah, and careful with that word. Yeah. Your yeah. phone might be ringing. <laughs> and the president had this to say about that financial bank regulation issue. Take a listen. I've called on Congress to give regulators the tools to hold bank executives accountable and I've called on regulators to strengthen regulations and supervision of large and regional banks. And folks, uh, we have to make sure that we're not back in this position again. And I think we're well on our way to be able to make that assurance. The president saying we're not back in this position again. This is the fourth bank failure. I mean, and there, and there are, this, to be clear, I mean, First Republic Bank, for weeks we were kind of expecting something, a shoe to drop, if you will. I mean, this was kind of a slow bleed out, and then it all just kind of hit it once over the past few days. But yes, I mean, we don't know how certain aspects of certain dangers that lurk in the financial system are ultimately going to play out at other places. Uh, what, what we saw was this pressure kind of acutely around uh, the interest rate increases and how that played out at some of these earlier bank failures that you mentioned. And then just the idea that you had, you know, very, very a uh, very intense concentration of certain types of depositors all pulling their money at once at First Republic. And, you know, there is still a lot of nerves. Even though the president's saying, no, this is kind of the end, people are still jittery, particularly in some of the regional and smaller banks. It's not just President Biden, to be clear. Jamie Dimon, CEO of J.P. Morgan, who came in and, and bought First Republic Bank, also said he thinks, you know, we're kind of near the end here. But there's still a lot of jitters out there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, not, everything's not resolved at this point. Well, finances and the economy were not the only things that Kevin McCarthy was asked about. That quick moment right. when he mentioned not meeting with the president today, there was a much more resonant uh, exchange that he had with a reporter, in this case, uh, a question on Russia. Here's his response. I support aid for Ukraine. I do not support what your country has done you to, to Ukraine. I do not support your killing of the children either. And I think for one standpoint, you should pull out. And I don't think it's right. And we will continue to support because the rest of the world sees it just as it is. Wendy, I think we can agree the most forceful comments we've heard from the speaker, who is now famous for saying no blank checks. Right. Essentially reframing his view on this. What does that do to the Marjorie Taylor Greens, the Lauren Boberts, the Matt Gateses in his caucus who say not another dollar for Ukraine? Right. Well, I think he's he's given them notice that this is not true. And as you and I were discussing earlier today, McCarthy tried to walk back that comment mm. about no blank check when the very right-wing Congress people that you just mentioned were all saying, that's right, no blank check, we're going to cut it off. And he sort of had to walk back and say, well, I didn't mean no blank check. Yeah. I meant, you know, we'll keep it going as long as we have to, but it can't be open-ended, um, you know, that sort of thing. But no, he's, he is saying that the, at least the House Republicans, and he is the highest-ranking Republican, I guess, um, he is saying that, um, no, we are going to keep the spigot open as yeah. long as Russia is raining missiles on children in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, it was very, it was very forceful, full right. throttle defense Absolutely. of Russia. And what was interesting, it was from, coming from a Russia reporter. So right. I think it also had a little bit more uh, emotional meaning, uh, meaning for Speaker McCarthy. Right. All right, our thanks to Bloomberg's Ben Bain and Wendy Benjaminson this Monday afternoon around the table. Coming up, Republican Senator Bill Haggerty of Tennessee will join us to discuss J.P. Morgan taking over First Republic Bank. That's next. This is Balance of Power. <laughs> Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg. 
J.P. Morgan acquiring First Republic Bank after the second largest U.S. bank failure in American history. Here's Democratic Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois in an exclusive interview earlier with Bloomberg's David Weston. And finally, Senator, you mentioned First Republic. Let's go back to that because that was the big news overnight. From what you understand of what the government's done here, what the Fed has done in the FDIC, did the government do the right thing? I think they did. I think we've been through this three or four times in, in varying degrees of magnitude, uh, and they're trying to make it clear that we're not going to allow some accident, some uh, failure of regulation, uh, some uh, element of the economy uh, bring down a major bank and cause real concern about the banking industry. So I think the regulators did the right thing. They need to hold these banks to good conduct, but we need to keep this economy in a stable position moving forward. That was Senator Dick Durbin speaking earlier today on Bloomberg. Joining us now from the other side of the aisle is Republican Senator Bill Haggerty of Tennessee. Senator, thank you so much for joining us. You heard what Dick Durbin had to say there, that he thinks the regulators did the right job stepping in. I know that last week after that report, you said that you think there needs to be a more uh, careful re to reevaluate the supervisory regime. What That's do you exactly expect right. to happen now? Do you think the regulators were correct when it comes to First Republic? Well, I think the uh, supervisors have done a much better job when the FDIC stepped in. They actually executed an auction. This is what I had fully expected when SV SVB went into uh, regulatory supervision over the weekend, you know, several weeks ago. That auction failed. That put us into uncharted territory. We wound up with a systemic risk exemption that created a tremendous amount of risk across the entire banking system. Today, we had happen what should have happened all along. That is that we had a bank open up on Monday with a new name on the door. Uh, the deal had been cut over the weekend, and now we have contained the risk, we've contained the contagion, and I think the markets are going to reflect that in a much more stable fashion right now. Well, so you're painting a real contrast uh, today, Senator. I remember you joined me on Bloomberg Radio the day after uh, the SVB failure, and you said there was a bid. They didn't take it. They should have. Now, in this case, there were more bids than J.P. Morgan. Was it the right one? It's hard to say, Joe. I haven't seen the bids, but I can tell you this. The fact is that they executed an auction this time. They didn't allow it to fail. And when you and I talked mm -hmm. about this several weeks ago, the fact that the FDIC allowed the auction to fail is something that I was extraordinarily critical of. And I criticized it loudly, broadly, and I think the FDIC has taken that to heart. I'm glad to see Chairman Grunberg uh, really focus on getting a deal done. And I'm pleased that they have a deal done at this point. It's a far better outcome than where we landed with SVB on that Monday uh, with, again, a systemic risk exemption uh, being called into play and a vast amount of uncertainty that was delivered into the marketplace as a result. Hmm. Senator, the Treasury Secretary put a, a spokesperson put out a statement. Biden also talked about it today. And what they are saying is that there's actually strength and resilience in the banking system. I want you to take a listen to this. These actions are going to make sure that the banking system is safe and sound, and that includes protecting small businesses across the country who need to make payroll for workers and their small businesses. And so let me be very clear. While depositors are being protected, shareholders are losing their investments. And critically, taxpayers are not the ones that are on the hook. Senator Biden really mentioned a number of times that this is not taxpayers that are on the hook. Um, at the same week, we're going to have a bank being bought by J.P. Morgan Chase. Essentially, First Republic failed. If J.P. Morgan didn't buy it, it was going into receivership or was. We also have the Fed hiking rates. Do you expect more banks to fail in the United States? Uh, look, I think the risk is certainly on the horizon, particularly for those banks that uh, wind up, as SVB did, as First Republic did, with a mis mismatch in their maturities versus, versus their, low, their, their interest rate risk. So, you know, that's a challenge that we've got to be cognizant of. But what needs to happen is that supervisors need to step up. Supervisors, if they're working from home, they need to get back to work. We need to not allow this to happen again. If you take a look at what happened with SVB, back in fall of last year, they gave SB, SVB a glowing report in terms of how they're managing their interest rate risk. We obviously know that was incorrect. These sorts of failures have to come to an end. The supervisors need to do their job. I'm glad to see that the FDIC running an auction did step up and do their job this past weekend, unlike the, the situation that occurred a number of weeks ago with SVB. But we need to see, and I'm going to continue to put pressure on every point of the system to make sure that the supervisors are stepping up and playing the role that we need them to play in order to keep our financial markets stable and sound.
Senator Haggerty, we got an X date roughly one hour ago from the Treasury Secretary, June 1st. I don't know if you have plans for the 1st of June, <laughs> but I wonder if it's time for a reality check here. No one we're talking with seems to think that's enough time uh, to solve this problem. I know it's been uh, going on for a long time, but with the markets in mind, would you favor suspending the debt ceiling to buy a couple of months here to get parties at the table to work all this out? I think the answer is actually very clear. Leader McCarthy has passed a bill now. He sent it over to the Senate. We need to just put that, that bill on the floor of the Senate. We need to vote on it. We need to get on this immediately. Uh, here we are, uh, you know, talking about nominees and a lot of other things. Uh, I think that uh, Chuck Schumer is going to put at least some hearings in place to begin to discuss this. But we need to step this, this up and accelerate everything. Again, Leader McCarthy has demonstrated leadership and put a bill on the table. We need to address it. I'm ready to put it to a vote right now. Punchbowl is actually just reporting right now that the speaker called President Biden about the debt limit and asked to meet him. But at the end of the day, we do know that the bill that Speaker McCarthy was able to get through Congress has no chance with Democrats. So at what point do you think potentially something can get done in the Senate? Well, I think what Democrats have to do is wake up and realize that they need to come to the table. I hope that reality is beginning to settle in because if they just continue to demand a blank check, that's not going to happen either. Either we go ahead and begin to address this out of control spending now, or the markets are going to do it for us. And I tell you, if we allow the markets to do it, the answer is going to be very, very ugly for America. Yeah, you're right about that, uh, Senator. We've seen at least some of this movie before. We're two weeks away now, if that X date is correct, from when uh, S&P downgraded our debt last time around. So with that in mind, as someone who serves on the banking committee and I know is sensitive to the markets, I just wonder your personal thought here. If Republicans and Democrats can't come to terms on this, at, at some point, something needs to happen. Would you favor actually allowing a default to happen in that case, or, or do you then turn to a clean debt bill? I think what we need to do is roll our sleeves up and get to the table right now. Uh, if the X date is at the point it is, that's just been announced uh, an hour ago, we need to take it with all the urgency that it suggests. And I'm ready to roll my sleeves up to sit down at the table. I think that we need to get all of our colleagues at the table right now to address this. We can do it in two weeks' time if we'll just put our nose to the grindstone and get it done. That's where we need to be. Hmm. And not... And if not able to get it done in two weeks' time, do you see this extension potentially into the fall? Or... You want to go into 2024? I, you know, I think there, there are a lot of potential options. I don't want to start laying options out right now and get ahead of the process. I want the process to commence post-haste. Again, we need to get to work on this rather than posturing and positioning and saying we're not going to negotiate. This is what's been you know, coming from the White House. We need to sit down and negotiate and come to terms. I think Kevin McCarthy has demonstrated his willingness to do it. He's demonstrated Republican resolve to put a bill on the table. The time now is to act. We're talking with Senator Bill Haggerty on balance of power. And, Senator, if we get back to where we started here with the banking crisis, mm -hmm. you're coming off a report from the Fed, an internal review at the end of last week. I just wonder, from the view of your committee, uh, what members of the banking committee see as next steps here to either prevent another failure or find accountability for the ones that already happened? Well, my focus right now is on accountability of the supervisory process that is underway. Uh, there was a lot of shade cast in the report that I don't think is deserved. What we need to do is make certain that our supervisors, that our regulators, I'm sorry, that our, that our supervisors are doing exactly what they should be doing. This was a failure of supervision. Uh, as opposed to coming back and calling for more regulation, that I don't think there's any argument that different regulations or more regulations would have changed the outcome of SVB. Uh, what we need to do is make certain that everybody's doing their job along the way. And that's going to require, you know, greater accountability at the San Francisco Fed in this case. Uh, it's going to require greater accountability at the FDIC when you look at how the auction was run. Again, I'm glad to see them execute an auction uh, this past weekend. They did not do that with mm -hmm. SVB. So I think we still got a lot to do in terms of looking at the failures that took place from a supervisory standpoint. That's where my attention will be focused. Senator, thank you. Senator Bill Haggerty of Great Tennessee with, with us on Balance of Power. Coming thank up, you. sparks continue to fly around the J.P. Morgan deal here as politicians and regulators weigh in about consolidation in the banking industry, one that even required an exception. We'll hear more from Kaylee Lines next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. I'm Joe Matthew, along with Anne-Marie Hordern, with breaking reports now that President Biden actually picked up the phone to clarify a story we were discussing a little bit earlier, picked up the phone and called Speaker Kevin McCarthy to meet on presumably the debt limit and the budget. But Anne-Marie, he's been very consistent so far that he's not talking about both. He wants a clean debt limit bill. But apparently there will be a meeting here in the next couple of days between these two as Speaker McCarthy makes his way back to yeah, the U.S. Also reports that the president has invited all four congressional leaders to a meeting to the White House. Mm -hmm. So this makes it probably a little bit more palatable for the White House. It's not just about McCarthy. It's congressional leadership. That's right. And now they have a date in front of them. It gives the president a little bit of protection potentially uh, in that meeting here. Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines is here with more on this now that we have an X date. Mm -hmm. Kaylee, here we go. Yeah, there's a reason why this conversation is now escalating and the White House maybe is starting to rush to talk to Speaker McCarthy, like McCarthy has been asking for for some time now, because Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen wrote a letter to McCarthy himself saying that their best estimate is that they will not be able to continue meeting the government's obligations by early June, potentially as early as June 1st. Now, it's worth saying that Wall Street strategists had expected that Yellen would be a little bit conservative in this. Mark Cabana and the team over at Bank of America saying that she likely needs to err on the side of caution, but in reality, it is Yellen's conservative forecast that the market should pay attention to rather than other forecasts forecasters' estimations of the X date. And the markets already are paying attention to this. If you look at different parts of the Treasury curve today, the government sold more than $50 billion worth of three-month T-bills. So that's paper mm. that matures three months from now. Yeah. Highest yield since 2001 wow. of 5.12%. Wow. So it goes how goes to show you how no one really wants to hold that paper. And then U.S. CDS, so the cost of insuring against a potential U.S. default, has skyrocketed to record levels well beyond what we saw even in 2011. Mm. And all of this was before we actually had the X date. Yes. The X date came out after the market. Right. So we'll have to wait and see what happens when futures open again in a little bit here. And then, of course, what happens in the Treasury market and the stock market tomorrow. We have been saying for a long time, guys, uh. that the market didn't seem like it was paying that much attention yet. If the market is now forced to, because we're talking a matter of weeks here... That could also force the hand of those who actually are negotiating this thing if you start to see the market turmoil really showing up. This, in a of big course, way. is a market that's just coming off the second largest bank failure in yes. U.S. history. Something else you've been covering today. Yeah, well, there is that. JP Morgan getting even bigger by buying First Republic. Also, all of this is happening, mind you, two days before the Fed is expected to hike rates. <laughs> right, the Again. bank failure. What could go wrong? Yeah. Another Fed hike <laughs> all in the same week. And the next date, Bloomberg's Katie Lyons is going to be busy this week. Thanks so much for joining us. Coming up, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy offering a full throated defense. Of U.S. aid to Ukraine and President Biden talking China with the president of the Philippines. We'll talk about all those hot spots and, of course, the first republic takeover where Congressman Michael McCall next. This is Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy vigorously defending U.S. support for Ukraine. And President Biden talking today to his counterpart in the Philippines about growing China's threat. We're going to break both of these down and more with the chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee, Congressman Michael McCall. Mr. Chairman, thanks for joining us at the Milken Institute in Beverly Hills today. It's great to see you. And I wonder if we could start with Ukraine. Yeah, Some of the most full-throated comments we've heard from Speaker McCarthy on supporting the war effort. He tried to turn the tables on a Russian correspondent during a news event today in Israel. Does that at all change the landscape for the Republican caucus in the House when it comes to debating funding for the war in Ukraine? Well, I think it's always important to have the Speaker uh, of the House uh, voice his strong opinion for Ukraine, I think that does impact the rest of our conference uh, and the, the House and the Senate. Um, I know uh, Kevin's always been there. Uh, I think after you talk to President Tsai as well, uh, the president of Taiwan, uh, that message was relayed to him very strongly. I know when I was in Asia, you know, the leaders in Japan, South Korea, and President Tsai uh, made it very clear that what happens in Ukraine directly impacts the situation. Uh, in, in the Pacific as well, because you've got a threat now not just to Europe, but also to the Pacific. What do you make of former President Trump's most recent comments? He said that he got along, get, used to get along very well with President Putin. He al also said that he thinks, quote, ultimately, Putin will conquer Ukraine. 
Is that the right rhetoric that the former president, the leader at the moment of your party, should be projecting? Yeah, I'm not familiar with, <clears throat> with that remark. Uh, I know a lot of his advisors um, are supportive of our efforts. I've been very critical of the administration, though, in terms of not giving them the weapons they need fast enough. Uh, and that's why it's dragged out as long as it has. Uh, but, you know, Emory, you're going to see a counteroffensive very soon now uh, that's going to take place. And I think there's going to be a lot riding on the line <clears throat> with this counteroffensive. If Ukraine is, is successful in the eyes of the American people and the world, I think it will be a game changer uh, for continued support. If they are not, that, that also will have a, a, an impact in a negative way, though. Um, my prediction is they, they will try to go down and uh, hit uh, the land bridge in Crimea uh, and have a very dramatic, uh, bold strategy uh, that then would push back Russian aggression, possibly then call for a ceasefire, uh, after which we could then maybe have negotiations to finally resolve this. Mr. Chairman, I want to ask you about President Biden's visit today with his uh, Philippine counterpart at the White House, an awfully important conversation as we consider security in the region here. How important will our relationship with the Philippines be in addressing threats from China? Uh, it, extremely important. Remember, uh, we have a forward operating base now, an agreement with the Philippines to operate um, you know, b both air, land, and sea out of the Philippines. We have that in Guam. We have the Seventh Fleet in Japan. We have a presence in South Korea. Uh, we also have AUKUS. We have, you know, Australia and the U.K. These are really uh, what would be the partners, if you will, or allies in the event of uh, uh, communist Chinese aggression. Um, but we don't have a NATO in the Pacific, and that's an important distinction. And that's why I think the deterrence is so important. You know, the weapons I signed off on three years ago have yet to go into Taiwan. When I met with President Tsai, uh, she uh, very much would like to have those today. Uh, and I urge yeah. the State Department uh, to get the weapons in as a deterrence for peace, uh, because right now the deterrence is not very strong. We also have the president today telling reporters that he's going to send a presidential trade delegation to the Philippines. So Joe is talking about the military. Now the president is also talking about a trade delegation. When it comes to shoring up allies outside of China, is this how it's going to be militarily and on the economic front? Right. And that's, that's a great point. This is not all about military. We need to strengthen our economic ties in the region. Uh, with the Pacific Island nations, uh, our security ties, you know, as well. And I think trade. Uh, I haven't seen a whole lot in terms of trade come out of this administration. Uh, I know they are negotiating a trade agreement with Taiwan, which would be a very important step forward in the region. So uh, I think you're, you're spot on. What we, what we need to do right now is get these partners aligned, uh, both economically but also militarily, and also plan... Uh, you know, for deterrence so we don't have to hopefully have an invasion, you know, take place. But if, God forbid, it does, um, we can't afford not to have those discussions today. Congressman, when you come home, it's going to be all about the X date. We learned from the Treasury now that today that the X date falls, in their view, on the 1st of June. And we're hearing now uh, from the White House, a uh, source at the White House telling us that President Biden has reached out to Speaker McCarthy and all of the leaders on Capitol Hill, in fact, to meet on this. Do you think Congress can get this done with the administration by the 1st of June? Or do you need to think about suspending the debt limit and buy more time? Well, we, uh, you know, look, we, we passed out of the House, I think, a very responsible package that caps spending at 2022 levels. Uh, that's discretionary non-defense spending. Um, and, uh, you know, savings of about $1.5 trillion. I, I, and then we, we do raise the debt ceiling. I think that's a, at least a starting point uh, for discussions. I haven't seen anything come out of the Senate, or have I seen the president make any real proposals. So I don't think anyone wants to see us default on our debt. And I think any uh, economist will tell you that's a, that's a bad scenario for the economy. 
Um, you know, we're worried about our financial system right now. You had a, you know, another uh, uh, systemic risk with one of the banks out there. Uh, and we're worried about the economic uh, vibrancy of this nation. And uh, defaulting on the debt is not the right step. But, but also, we have $32 trillion of debt out there. That is unconscionable and immoral to hand that down to the next generation. So we believe as Republicans, we've, we've at least have did something about this. We governed. We got a bill passed. So let's, let's go ahead and get this thing fixed. Congressman, not only are you the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, so I know you're constantly in discussion with foreign officials, but you're also at the Milken Conference, and I'd love to know, what are you hearing from people on the ground there and from your foreign contacts about how nervous they are about the U.S. hitting the debt ceiling? Right. I don't think any foreign nation uh, would like to see that happen. I know they don't think it's in our best interest, and they sure don't think it's in their best interest. You know, our economies are all intertwined, uh, and we would not want to send a shockwave around the, the globe uh, if we default on our debt. So this is a very serious issue, and we have to be responsible, not irresponsible, in the way we deal with it. Uh, so again, I don't think either side wants us to see a default, nor do I think any other nation would. Maybe perhaps our foreign adversaries would like to see that. But, but as I see this dangerous world we're in with Russia, China, Iran, North Korea lining up against the free West, um, you know, this is not a time to be playing ga games with our national debt. But having said all that, at some point in time, we're going to have to talk about the real driver of spending, and that's mandatory spending. What we deal with is only one third uh, of the, uh, the uh, budget, of the appropriations. Two thirds is on auto glide path. And it's not sustainable, and everybody knows that in Washington, but politicians are too afraid to talk about it uh, to, to try to find a real solution to that problem. Congressman, thank you so much for your time. Congressman Michael McCall there joining us from the Milken Conference in California. Coming to the program, we're going to break down the implication of J.P. Morgan's takeover of First Republic with our political panel and also this call President Biden made to Speaker McCarthy regarding the debt ceiling. This is Balance of Power. Now, keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. I'm John Hyland. Russian targeted Ukrainian cities with cruise missiles early today. Ukraine's military says 15 out of 18 of them were shot down. Meanwhile, President Volodymyr Zelensky spoke with France's President Emmanuel Macron. Macron's office says they discussed Europe's coordination of military aid to be able to respond to Ukraine's needs. And Paris, anger over the French president's pension reform spilled into the streets today. More than half a million people marched across France to challenge a law raising the retirement age. The May Day protest marks a rare event since World War II when labor unions of France have come together. Symbols of corporate power such as the Louis Vuitton Foundation on the outskirts of Paris were defaced. And in Canada, about 120,000 government workers have ended a strike that began on April 19th. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government agreed to wage hikes of about 12 percent over four years. About 35,000 workers for Canada's tax agency are currently still on strike. The Supreme Court has agreed to take up a case that could change how federal agencies define their own powers. Four New Jersey fishing companies are asking the court to reconsider their 1984 decision that set up what's known as the Chevron Doctrine. Democratic administrations have relied on that ruling to justify mandates on energy, the environment and the workplace. The Supreme Court has chipped away at the doctrine in recent years, but this will be its first direct challenge. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Originals. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm John Hyland, and this is Bloomberg. We are all very pleased to get the, the major source of uncertainty that was remaining from the recent bank turmoil addressed. And that, that is a good thing, because fundamentally the U.S. financial system is sound. 
That was Citigroup CEO Jane Frazier earlier at the Milken Conference in Beverly Hills. We're going to bring in our panel now, Bloomberg contributors, Rick Davis, Stone Court Capital Partner, of course, and Jeannie Shanzano, Iona College Political Science Professor. Thank you both for joining us. Before we talk about what happened this morning, which, of course, we thought potentially was going to be the biggest news from Wall Street to Washington, which is J.P. Morgan buying First Republic, this bank failing, the fourth in the United States to fail in a matter of months. We now have an X date, and not only an X date, President Biden's picking up the phone. He called Speaker McCarthy and McConnell. He wants the congressional leadership to join him at the White House May 9th. Rick, first to you, does this deal get cut between Biden and McConnell, like the prior one did in this administration, to hammer out uh, a deal to not go over this cliff, this uh, debt ceiling cliff? Yeah, I would say this is the first real light in the idea that we could get a bipartisan solution to this debt limit. Uh, you know, it's the same kind of approach that Biden used when he was vice president in 2011, get the parties together, get them over the White House and knock out a deal. Uh, if you listen to everybody uh, on Capitol Hill, both Republicans and Democrats, there's nobody who wants a default. And so everyone's starting in the same place. How do we get a deal cut? Um, House GOP has already shown their cards. And there's more to go, but I think this is a perfect opportunity for Biden on the uh, right after the X date has been announced to jump into the middle of this. It, it, it was something everyone was waiting for, and now it looks like there could be a deal. So not a huge shock to see the invite go out here, Jeannie, but he, he invited, to be clear, congressional leaders, not just Speaker McCarthy, who I think wanted to have a one-on-one -on -one and somehow uh, win the day here. Does that give Joe Biden cover to have Chuck Schumer at the table, never mind Mitch McConnell, and, and what will be his position at the outset? Does he stick with a clean debt limit bill? You know, I think his position is going to be the same that he's been talking about, which is that we have to pay the bills that we have racked up to do anything otherwise would to risk the full faith and credit of the United States. And then let's have a discussion about this, you know, the budget going forward and how we want to work going forward. And I think we did hear some of this over the weekend. We heard Bernie Sanders out talking about the fact that they should be negotiating and can be negotiating tomorrow, provided Republicans are agree we won't go crashing away and we will negotiate on the budget. So I think that's what we're starting to see here. I wish I was as optimistic as Rick that it's the start of a deal. I think it's the start of talks, but I am very, very concerned about the time frame here. As Janet Yellen says, we are, you know, maybe June 1st, maybe a little bit that beyond that. And you look at the congressional calendar, they don't meet very much between now and then. And so it is a really, really really difficult calendar. I think maybe a short-term solution to raising or suspending the debt ceiling buys them some time, and then hopefully they're able to negotiate this thing out. Well, that's what's concerning everyone, is the fact that they're going to be meeting May 9th, and that only gives them less than a month to what Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says is, is the X date. Rick, would you say a win is for them just to kick the can down the road? No, they want to get this over with. Nobody wants this hanging over their heads. During a uh, presidential election year, uh, the House wants to get on to do other things. This is instability personified, right? I mean, what will the Senate do if not, you know, take this up in the short haste? And and Jeannie's right. There's only 19 days of um, work that the Senate and the House are doing uh, between now and June 1st. So it's not like there's a lot of time. And and I think actually that's what creates the pressure to actually get a deal done. So uh, I think everybody wants to... What does a deal to... look like, Rick? I mean, we're talking about the debt limit, so it w would it include a date for the, the debt ceiling and then, what, a specific number on top-line cuts? How does Joe Biden actually pull this off in such little time? Yeah, look, if you take the House bill and just negotiate from that, you got a trillion and a half dollars of cuts that you can whittle down, and you've got an, you've got an extension of the debt limit for a year. Um, I'm sure that Biden would like to see that debt limit extended beyond the election uh, for his own yes. good. In the and so I think that'll be one of the, the big negotiating points. All right, coming up, we're going to be back with our panel. Rick and Jeannie stay with us to discuss potential legislation to impose an ethics code for the U.S. Supreme Court. An important story next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV.
enclosed or included with his letter declining the invitation was troubling. He really spelled out what the current, what the justices think are the current standards. I don't think they're adequate. Clarence Thomas has proved positive of that. But he rationalized that what they have is good enough. I don't think it is. Senate Judiciary Chair Dick Durbin talking with our colleague David Weston earlier today on Bloomberg, vowing to press ahead with legislation to impose an ethics code for the U.S. Supreme Court. He's not the first, but as chair of the judiciary, it carries some weight. And we want to bring back our panel for more on this. Bloomberg contributors Rick Davis of Stone Court Capital, Jeannie Shanzano from Iona College. Uh, Jeannie, what's your take on this? We just, I think, established that it would be very difficult uh, for Congress to even figure out a budget in the time that it needs to do its work. Are we, are we really opening this can of worms following uh, the, the most recent revelation of Justice Clarence Thomas's relationship with Harlan Crow? We are opening a can of worms, but it's critically important. You know, what has happened with the Supreme Court is so frustrating and unfortunate. You see not only this issue with Clarence Thomas, but you also see Sam Alito just late last week with, you know, taking, making statements made him sound more like a political activist than an objective justice. The highest court in the land has the lowest ethical standards. They have long told us historically, trust us, we got this, and now you look billionaires buying homes for people's mothers taking lavish vacations it's time that Congress stood up the Senate stood up and the American people stood up and said you should have and live under the same ethical code as other judges across the country because quite frankly we don't have the faith in you we should at this point so it is critically important that the Senate pursues this I'm not sure they're gonna get there but they should open the discussion right now and I wish John Roberts was going to testify. Well, this is what Justice Alito, uh, you, you alluded to this, uh, Jeannie, said to the Wall Street Journal. I personally have a pretty good idea who is responsible, but that's different from the level of proof that is needed to name somebody. <laughs> Rick, should he have been uh, so candid about who he thinks potentially the leaker is? Uh, it almost insinuates that he thinks it's coming uh, from potentially a, a liberal-minded individual at the court. Well, I, I, I think it's pretty expressed that that's where he thinks it's coming from. And so, uh, look, all these guys have their own opinion. It's a little unusual, uh, one, uh, to have this opinion leak out on the Dobbs decision. It's even more unusual to then opine on who you think the leaker is. Last I heard, they ran an investigation, and we never really got a clear airing of what happened in that yeah. investigation, but it sounds like they didn't find anything. Rick and Jeannie, uh, we spent some time on Saturday night with Dark Brandon. <laughs> as I believe was trending well, he said it himself in this case. President Biden having some fun with the aviators in a pretty good routine, as you would expect at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. That's the job. But his age uh, was something that he decided to, to isolate for a laugh. Listen. Headline. <laughs> Biden's advanced age is a big issue. Trump's, however, is not. You say I'm ancient. I say I'm wise. <laughs> you say I'm over the hill. Don Lemon would say that's a man of his prime. <laughs> Not going to ask you about Don Lemon, uh, Jeannie, but is this the way to deal with age? Take a page out of the Reagan book and try to get a laugh. That's right. I think he did a brilliant job. And Roy Wood Jr., I like the joke. You guys were there. I want to see a picture of you both. But I like the joke about the French versus the U.S., uh, somebody at 80 asking for a job, and the French protesting because they, they have to work at 64. So I thought it was well done on both parts. Uh, Rick, just to this point, Biden was on display not just as president, of course, making some jokes, uh, bringing some levity to situations, but also, of course, as a candidate, 2024. And issues right now he's facing just in this week is debt ceiling, another failed bank. Um, how much is all of this going to play going into 2024? And, and don't forget, uh, Federal Reserve uh, looking to increase rate hikes that may slow down the economy and create more unemployment. Uh, it's a really bad period of time to be an incumbent. You know, incumbency wants stability. And then you use the trappings of the office to kind of leverage your own image. Uh, Biden starts with a very poor image and a very bad economy, and, and one that seems to always throw curveballs to this White House. They can't seem to get ahead of the banking crisis. They can't seem to get ahead of recession. They can't seem to get ahead of the inflation curve. And so I think it's a real problem for him. 
Rick, we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks to our Bloomberg contributors, Rick Davis, and of course, Jeannie Shanzano for joining us this Monday. Check out our Washington Edition newsletter for more of these stories on the terminal and online. Catch you back here tomorrow on Bloomberg.